Well, hey, good morning, good afternoon. Whatever time of day it is that you're watching us, we are so glad you're joining us uh, today for church. And I just wanted to open up this moment just inviting you to sing along with us, worship along, wherever it is you are. Let's take the words of this song. Let it take root in our heart. Here we go. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. I need you. And 
the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom of my life oh he is my song you are good
taking this moment to recognize your goodness in our lives, Father God. Your love for us that, that goes beyond so much more than we could ever imagine. The way in which you've cared for us, the way in which you've showed your love for us in this creation, God. Even in this moment, even in this season, Father, in this time of for some of us, just great chaos and unrest, God. We, we want to rest in knowing that you're good, God. We want to rest in having the confidence in knowing that you're good, that you're faithful, that you're mighty, that you love us. God. We love you. Amen. I'm excited to see what you come up with as ways to keep yourselves from getting bored during this time. Me, I have found a great way to do that. It works if you have kids. It works especially well if you have young kids. Here's what you do. First, cancel school. Second, don't leave the house for six weeks. You might go crazy, but you will not be bored. Trust me, I know. My name is Matt Van Gent. I'm the executive pastor at Crosswinds. I know that this season has been challenging for so many of us. Whether it feels like a big challenge for you or, or feels small, we would love to pray for you during this time. You can send prayer requests to our email address, prayer at crosswindschurch.org, or you can call the prayer hotline 925-560-3800, extension 146. It's the first Sunday of the month, so that means it's still pastor and elder prayer. If you would like a pastor or elder to pray with you, just mention that when you give us your prayer request, and one of them will be contacting you this week to pray with you. Beyond that, if you've got some tangible needs, we've got a care team that is ready and waiting to help with that. You can email them care at crosswindschurch.org. Let them know how we can help, let them know what your need is, and they are ready and waiting to respond. Well, Crosswinds, it has been so cool to see how we have made this transition to digital church, to see the ways that we have still been being the church, even when we can't gather together as the church. 
whether it's watching videos online as we worship and learn together, or doing virtual small groups, or even worshiping through giving. That's a way that you can continue to be part of this church during this time. You can give online. We've got a link on our, on our homepage, crosswindschurch.org, where you can sign up for that. Well, I don't know about you, but it has been so hard for me to keep these days straight while sheltering in place. Can you believe it is Good Friday this coming week? Our associate pastor, Jody Tay, has put together a self-guided reflection retreat that you can do. You can spread this out over a couple of days or you can do it all at one shot, but basically it's a way for you to spend some time reflecting and preparing for Good Friday. You'll have some time to, to reflect on Jesus' sacrifice that he made on the cross and anticipate, look forward to what we get to celebrate at Easter. And speaking of Easter, this next Sunday is Easter. We might not be together at the church property, but Easter is still happening. Easter is still going to be amazing. It is going to be such a special service. I encourage you, just like we do in years past, think about who you can invite to that service. Now, you might not be able to physically be with them for that service. You might not be inviting them to a church building, but you can still invite them to watch that message. This season that we're in, it, it can be so hard to maintain hope. What better time to invite someone to watch this service as we remember the hope that we have in Jesus. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like every time I leave my house right now, I've got to be careful about what I touch. Uh, of course, we know with the shelter in place, there's a limited amount of, of spots that we can go. You can go to the supermarket. Uh, you can go out to restaurants that offer carryout service only. Um, you can go to the doctor. But generally speaking, we're limited. And even when I go to those places I just mentioned, like I said, I'm a little nervous because I, I feel like the virus could be anywhere on anything. Um, I, I was picking out avocados the other day at Trader Joe's, and, and, and as I picked one up to squeeze it and see how ripe it was, I realized I am probably the 10th person to have touched this avocado. And then I put it in my cart and I brought it home, a little afraid to actually eat it. Um, I drove through Starbucks the other day. There's a new one right by the church, and our, our staff have been building friendships with the baristas. We've been getting to know them. And I saw Amanda at the drive-thru, who I had not seen in a few weeks because I'm sheltering in place. And as I paid with my credit card, I realized, oh man, she's been touching other people's credit cards and those people have touched who knows what and now it's on my hands. What can I do? 
So I quickly got some hand sanitizer out. I put it on. Um, by the way, the only hand sanitizer that our family has is the stuff that our kids had around, which means my hands look like they're covered in glitter, and I smell like a preteen girl most days right now. I, I literally have a bottle in my pocket as we speak called Mermaid. But I, I got the hand sanitizer out. I, I quickly sanitized my hands, and then I picked up my drink, and I put it to my mouth realizing, wait, the hands that touch the credit card touch the lid on this cup. Is it safe to drink this? All right, we feel surrounded by it, right? And, and it's not just the virus. There, there are probably any number of things that you feel surrounded by right now. Uh, maybe you feel surrounded by your fears or surrounded by doubt. Maybe surrounded by annoyance, depending on how many people you're packing into your shelter and how annoying they are. Uh, maybe you feel surrounded by questions. Why is this happening? Why would God allow this? Or maybe you're out of work or, or you own a small business and you're not bringing in any revenue right now and you're surrounded by bills, wondering how you're going to pay them right now, surrounded by debt. Well, I was thinking about that this week, especially leading up to today as we kick off Holy Week. I was thinking about the idea of how we are surrounded by all these things and, and then this terrifying thing, this virus, this enemy that would try and defeat us, it, it, it got me thinking about Jesus and the things that he was surrounded by that week leading up to the cross, this week that we remember as Christians. Think about it for a minute. Jesus was arrested by soldiers, surrounded in that moment by people who were armed and ready to fight him if he put up a fight. He was surrounded by people at his trial who were ready to pronounce him guilty and, and send him to a sentence. He, he was surrounded by those who would watch him get paraded through the streets on the way up to this hill where he would be crucified. Many of those onlookers who were happy to see him go through what he was going through. Ultimately, he was nailed to the cross surrounded by more soldiers who would mock him and put a sign over his head that read king of the jews and and rolled the dice for his clothes and and pierced him in the side I mean, really those final hours of jesus life are the story of jesus surrounded by enemies who we later learn that jesus forgives right father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing but but that doesn't take away from the fact that is, we are surrounded right now by all of those things that I mentioned, our fears, our doubts, our questions, our unemployment, and, and a real enemy, this virus. As we are surrounded, we go into this week remembering a Savior who was surrounded by enemies as well. So, knowing that Jesus was surrounded, and you are too, can, can I tell you something that's always bugged me about the story of Jesus on the cross? that Jesus, surrounded by people who would see him go down, that Jesus would be abandoned by God the Father. In the middle of all that he's going through, all the things that I just said, as he's hanging on the cross, Jesus would be left alone by God. He would be forsaken. That part of the story drives me crazy. Um, it is likely you know the part that I'm talking about. There is this moment where Jesus says this terrible line. It's terrible and that nobody should ever have to say it. It says in Matthew 27 that as Jesus was hanging on the cross, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doesn't that rub you the wrong way a little bit? I, I mean, if you attended our service last week, and by attended, I mean sat on your couch in your pajamas watching like everybody else. Um, if you attended, you know that last week I talked about God being with us wherever we go, right? Yet, yet here he is in this moment where Jesus needs the Father more than any other moment. Here he is being abandoned. Jesus is in the fight of his life. I mean, this is the battle of his life. For the father to forsake him, leave him alone, to, to make it under his own power, what kind of God does that? What kind of father? Well, this matters because maybe you are somebody who feels abandoned by God and all that's going on right now. Maybe you feel like he's just left us to fend for ourselves and, and try to get out of this thing under our own power, which honestly does not 
feel like enough. And, and maybe as you've been surrounded right now, you're asking the question, God, why have you abandoned us? Why have you forsaken me? Maybe you're not asking it, but in the next two weeks, you will. And I want to show you something today that would indicate that we have been reading this statement of Jesus all wrong. I want to show you something in the Bible that's going to give you incredible insight into what was on Jesus' mind while he was on the cross. Believe it or not, I think we're able to know exactly what Jesus was thinking about during those hours that he was surrounded, and it's going to show you that he was not abandoned, and it's going to show you that God has not abandoned you. In fact, what we're going to look at is going to speak to you about whatever it is that you're feeling surrounded by right now. I cannot wait for you to see this. But first, how are you with song lyrics? Like, if I were to say, you know, start a song and then stop halfway through the lyrics, would you be able to fill them in? Um, let's try a few. I'm going to start a song, and then in your living room or wherever you're watching this, whoever you're with, you try to fill in the lyrics, okay? Okay. First one, uh, I'm going back a little bit. 1969, Neil Diamond. Let's try it. Sweet Caroline. Bum, bum, bum. Good times. All right. I'm sure you got that one. Let's do another one, all right? Uh, this time, let's go early 80s. The police. Every breath you take. Good. I'm sure you got it. Easy one, easy one. And by the way, Sorry that I'm singing it all for you right now, making you have to sit through this. But one more, one more. Backstreet Boys, late 90s. You are my fire. Okay, the problem with me putting that song out there, now you're going to be singing it the rest of this video and not watching. I mean, you'll be watching, but really the whole time you're going to just be thinking about the Backstreet Boys. But don't do that because... <laughs> We're about to get serious, back to Jesus on the cross, and you do not want to be singing, I want it that way, while you're hearing about the cross. I'm showing you that you know all the lyrics to all of these songs because there was a song that Jesus knew. In fact, any good Jewish person knew back in that day, and it was a song written by King David many years earlier, and this song was all about being surrounded by your enemies. Um, the song is actually a cry out to God to be rescued, to be saved from the taunts and the torments. And like a lot of the songs that David wrote, this song is recorded in the Bible. It's Psalm 22. All right, time out. Did you know that the word psalm means song? The whole book of psalms in the Bible is a collection of songs sung by the people of God over the years. There's 150 of them in the Bible. That, that doesn't mean there are only 150 songs that were ever written, sung by the Israelites. It's just that these 150 were the most meaningful, the most celebrated, the most known songs. And Psalm 22 was not some obscure B-side that a few people in Jesus' world might have heard. Psalm 22, Jesus would have known by heart. And that is important because as he hung on the cross and needed a prayer to pray, with 150 plus psalms to choose from, he chose this one. And I want to share with you the first line of the song as we see it in Psalm 22. You ready? This is written by David 600 years earlier than Jesus on the cross. And the song begins, let's put it up on the screen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? See, when the Gospels record that Jesus said this line, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What they're trying to tell us is that Jesus began singing this song. Now, maybe that makes you feel a little better about Jesus saying that line about God forsaking him because maybe it didn't really happen. Maybe that's just how the song goes, and it's just the sentiment of David way back when, but it doesn't reflect what Jesus is experiencing. Okay, but then, of all the songs, why would Jesus choose this one? Why not choose the one that, that begins, I praise God, he is wonderful, he does great things. Why not choose the ancient version of Party Rock Anthem? Party Rock is in the house, dude. Okay, well, the answer to that lies in the rest of this song. It is 31 verses. We don't have time for me to read every single one to you, but... Let me just show you the next verse. You, you, you'll see why Jesus chose this specific song. Verse two, 
My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. Okay, that's not exactly positive either. So far, the song is a downer, but, but wait a second. Take a look at verse 3. You guys, verse 3 does a 180. Yet, okay, you know there's going to be a tone shift when you hear the word yet. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one that Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. Jesus on the cross is praying the lyrics to a song. And, and yes, the song he chooses begins with saying, why have you forsaken me? But by the third line, he's praying, yet, God, I know that I can trust you and you'll deliver me. I know that you hear my cries and you will not let me down. Now, again, this song is 31 verses. I will not show all of them to you. Can I show you a few others that are huge for helping you understand why Jesus chose this song and even more why this matters for you right now? In verse seven, the song goes, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Okay, leave that up on the screen for a second. Did I put up the wrong passage? Is that David or is that Jesus? All who see me mock me and hurl insults and shake their heads. They shout out, let God rescue you. Doesn't that sound like it's directly from the crucifixion story, the, the story of Jesus on the cross? But it's not. This song was written 600 years earlier, and yet Jesus is going through some of the very things this song is talking about. You can see why he chose this song. Okay, verse 12 of this song, it says, Many bulls surround me, strong bulls encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, uh, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. That is so Jesus in this moment on the cross. Surrounded, David uses the imagery of bulls and lions. And these lines to the song help you see what Jesus felt as he hung there, like, like roaring lions opened their mouths to tear him apart. The song even says, I am poured out like water and my bones are out of joint. Okay, one more somewhat graphic verse. Verse 16, dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them, and they cast lots for my garment. Huh? Again, are, are you sure this wasn't written by Jesus? Because this is Jesus. This is more Jesus' experience than it was ever David's experience. Right. You're right. It's what we call a prophetic moment in scripture. David is writing this song using imagery and metaphor that did not mean to him what it would mean to Jesus. I mean, it meant something to David, but he wasn't going through it literally like Jesus would. It's like when the Backstreet Boys sing, you are my fire. They don't mean it literally. The girl is not on fire. It's a song, it's art, it's metaphor. But 600 years later, the metaphor is a reality and Jesus is living it. Again, surrounded by enemies, nowhere to go. And these lines in the song that would express this, this emotional sense of abandon, like, like God has left me to figure this out on my own, to try and make it through this on my own power. Did Jesus feel abandoned by the Father on the cross? Maybe. Maybe there were moments where he could identify with David who wrote, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Maybe you can identify with this song of David, surrounded by an enemy right now, and, and you're left to figure this out by yourself. You feel that way. But, but if you think that Jesus chose this song because he felt abandoned, what you need to know is that Jesus didn't just choose a song about being forsaken and being surrounded. He chose a song with a great ending. He chose a song that starts with abandonment, being forsaken, but it's all set up. It's all set up for an ending with a big twist. After this song lists everything that's going wrong, here are the next lines. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. 
Jesus cries out for God to draw near. And then he says in verse 22, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. Okay, check this out. Here's the big twist. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Jesus opens with, my God, why have you forsaken me? But, but then by verse 24, he's singing a different sentiment. Wait a second. You have not hidden your face. You have listened to my cry. Here's the thing. The father did not abandon Jesus on the cross in his greatest moment of need. And he has not abandoned you. This battle you are in, that all of us are in, where we feel surrounded on all sides by an unknown enemy, this thing that seems so hard to defeat, you don't fight it alone. You have a God fighting right alongside you, and he will not leave you during this. He is with you every step of the way, and in fact, he is the one who is surrounding you right now. Everywhere you go, every supermarket trip, every Starbucks drive through every walk through your neighborhood where you cross the street to make sure you're at least six feet away from the virus walking towards you and your potentially contagious neighbor. You think you're surrounded by this virus or by your fear or by your doubts, your questions, by your annoyances, by your financial uncertainty, surrounded by this enemy. And you are, I'm not taking that away. I don't want to minimize it. But you are more surrounded by God. There is this one moment in the Holy Week story that kind of gets lost in the lead up to the crucifixion. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and and you probably know the story. Judas brings these soldiers to come and arrest him, and Judas kisses Jesus to identify to the soldiers which one Jesus is, and they start to grab him, right? And Peter jumps up with his sword, and he strikes one of them and cuts his ear off, like full-on Vincent Van Gogh, the guy loses an ear. And Jesus says to Peter, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. That's the part that everybody remembers. Okay, right after, Jesus says this next line. It's the part I think that gets lost. He says, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? A legion, a Roman legion was 5,000 men. And so he says here, Peter, this battle you want to fight under your own power, don't you know that God has ready at his disposal to fight for us 60,000 angels? But he says, Peter, I'm not going to call on God because I have another mission in mind, which we know the mission was to die for our sins. But the part that we skip is that Jesus seems to know something we don't know, that there are legions of angels ready to fight our battles with us and for us, and we are not in this alone. We do not fight under our own strength. When we are surrounded, God has our back. Peter, don't you know that when we're surrounded by our enemies, God is with us, and he's bigger, and he's got armies waiting for him to give the signal. Now, where did Jesus come up with that idea? Did he just know it because he's God and he and the Father are one? And so as part of that, he knows what God has at his disposal, ready to do battle for us? Probably. But it's also likely that just like Jesus knew that song we looked at, he knew a story, a, a short little story from the history of God's people. And I want to close by telling you that story. And It's going to pull all of this together. Jesus would have known this story about this guy, Elisha. One day, Elisha and his servant, who who had been helping the king of Israel by giving him advice about his enemies, the Syrians, one day, Elisha and his servant, who were on the run because the Syrians were after these two, one day, or, or one night rather, they found a city to sleep in and they went to bed. And while they were there sleeping, the Syrian army found out that Elisha was there in this city and they surrounded the city under the cover of darkness. They all got in place. And the plan was that when the sun rose, they would attack the city and capture Elisha. So early the next morning, Elisha's servant woke up a little bit too early, kind of pre-dawn, and he started going through his morning routine, brushing his teeth, whatever he did in the morning, making coffee. And just as the sun began to give off a little bit of light, 
Um, you know the time I'm talking about? Not the part of the morning where the sun is even in the sky, but the part where it's getting close to the horizon and you can start seeing a little bit of an outline of the landscape around you. Right at that part of the morning, Elisha's servant sees that they are surrounded by the Syrian army. Horses, chariots. Just, just like you have started to realize in the past few weeks that, that you're surrounded right now by all of those things I mentioned, the virus included, a sneaky enemy. We are surrounded. So the servant sees this and he wakes up Elisha and he says, oh no, my Lord, what are we gonna do? And Elisha wakes up, he gets out of his bed, he puts his arms on the shoulders of his servant and he says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That is a hardcore line. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. God opened the servant's eyes to see that as much as they were surrounded by the enemy, the enemy was surrounded by God. I, I can't help but think that maybe Jesus was thinking of that story when he said to Peter, don't you know that God would send legions of angels if we asked him to? Don't you know that in this battle you fight against an unseen enemy that seems to be all around you? Don't you know that what you're really surrounded by is God? Maybe today you're the servant in that story. You found yourself worried and panicked and, and wondering how you fight this enemy on your own strength. Maybe you've even felt abandoned, forsaken, thinking, God, why have you left me? Maybe you've been a little bit more hopeful throughout this thing, but you're still looking at the effect that it's had on our economy and, and our school system, our, our social fabric, and you are saying, God, where are you right now? Where have you been? And, and what I am doing as your pastor right now is praying like Elisha did, like Jesus did on the cross. God, would you open our eyes so that we may see that we are truly surrounded by you? As we lead into Easter week, may you know that you are not abandoned. You are surrounded by our God who listens to our cry for help. Derek is gonna teach us a new song that, that I hope as you are surrounded becomes a song that you can own in your fight this week. This is how I find my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles.
This is how I fight my battle. Oh, this is how we fight our battle. Oh. Yeah, this is how we fight our battle. It may look, it may look, it may look like I'm surrounded, and I'm surrounded by you. present in our battle, Father. We are not far off, that we're not alone. Even in moments of great isolation and great fear, you are there, giving us strength, giving us courage, calling us yours, Father God. We put our hope in that. We base our hope knowing that you're good, knowing that you're faithful. 